Today, I wanted to talk about the curve. Now, I've spoken with several people from Europe and some people in America about the curve, and, and I'm getting strange numbers, numbers that I'm unfamiliar with. You know, I had a teacher in grad school, Al Genovese, and there was a person that took a lesson with him. I said, how did it go? And he says, well, east is east and west is west, and never the twain shall meet. And so I think what I'm going to try to explain to you is that you cannot make an American-style read with a European-style gouge. It's not really possible. And there are a few things that enable Americans to play these strong gouges on their instruments, mainly because most people in this country play lore oboes. Lore oboes kind of work well with strong gouges. But if you play a brand other than lore, a smaller board instrument, strong reeds don't work. I prefer weaker setups as opposed to strong setups, at least in my old age, because they vibrate. Strong setups, strong reeds don't vibrate, and you have to make them vibrate. Weaker setups vibrate much more, but there is an overriding principle between the two reeds. The weaker setup, you have to focus on the forward part of the reed, the tip and the blend and the catch. But with strong setups, hard cane, strong reeds, you have to scrape further toward the back of the reed because strong setups don't want to vibrate. Now, when Mac made strong setups, he did it using an American gouge. But what's happening is that a lot of Philadelphians are going this route of making strong gouges, but through a European model. And that's a problem, and ironic as well, because the American style comes from Philadelphia. This is Tabato's contribution. This is his genius to the American oboe playing, is that in his time he realized that you cannot put a 19th century reed in a 20th century oboe. Now, Europe has continued to go on with their way, but we don't do that here. It's very different, and there's an underlying reason for this a basic principle of it, and that is the gouge. The gouge is the most important aspect of the reed, not how you scrape it. When you scrape a reed, you are coping with what has been presented to you. What I need to explain is that the reason why Tabato did what he did, and that is, you know, the older reeds from previous centuries were shorter, wider, fatter reeds because the oboes were shorter and they had bigger bores. So it would accommodate the instrument. When you take those reeds and you put them on a modern oboe, the high notes don't come out. And so they realized that they had to make the reed more narrow in order for the high notes to come out. But by not scraping all of the bark off of the reed, the low notes don't come out as well. And this is what Tabato was trying to do. He was trying to combine the two so that you would have a homogeneous range from low notes to high notes and that they would speak with relative ease in all octaves and with a beautiful tone because essentially what the American style is supposed to be about is tone, the tone of the sound of the instrument throughout the register so that you don't have notes popping out here and there, strident and whatnot. So in the way he did that, by making the shape narrower, but scraping more of the bark off of the reed, then you would enable more of the reed to vibrate. But this presents a real problem because you cannot scrape all the bark off the reed if you're using the bark to keep the opening because the reed collapses. The strength of it should keep the openings. So you have to have a stronger, thicker center because the center is what determines the strength of the reed. The channels determine the vibration and the sides filter the tone. So the heavier the sides, the more tone is, is filtered throughout the reed, making it seem darker, let's say. But actually what it is is more fundamental of the instrument and less of the overtones of the reed. So Tabato realized that by changing the guide, you could keep the strength in the center of the reed, maintain the opening, have the reed vibrate, and filter the overtones of the reed 
through the sides. So in a sense, the reed became inverted, and that was his contribution. And he did that by working with graph and coming up with the guide, which is 5 millimeters on one side and 5.5 millimeters on the other side. Manipulating the blade, he could come up with a gouge that was somewhat circular in the center to improve vibration, but then dramatically angled on the sides, or in this case, the smaller side, to give a thicker sides, uh, maintaining an opening, ensuring the strength, and thickening the reed, which is, went from 57 to 5960. What I wanted to present was an analysis of the different curves. I figured I would do it in Fusion so that we could kind of see what's going on. So on one of the machines, uh, I believe it's the Cooney Bear. This one has an 11 millimeter bed, which is a 5.5 radius. And the blade is 11.4 diameter blade. That's going to give you a very flat curve. I mean, this guide is a 10 and a half guide, and there would definitely have to be a different guide there. It just doesn't fit. But you can see with the blade that it's a very flat curve. This area right in here, it's an 11 millimeter bed and we've got an 11.4 millimeter blade. There's just too much material in the middle. There's just a lot of material. This is the strength, but this is the vibration. And if you have this kind of curve coming off to the sides like this, there's going to be a strong gouge because that strength is being distributed evenly across the blade. It's flat, but it's strong. And, you know, in Europe, their gouges are 57. If you take this gouge and you make this 60, you're going to have so much material in the middle that really the only place you're going to be able to scrape is the center of the reed. It will have no tone because it'll just be very strong and the sides will not have the opportunity to filter because they'll be so clasped together so tightly. Now here's another one which I think is reeds and stuff where there's a 10 millimeter bed and an 11 millimeter blade. Now this guide, and this is the thing, is that it's important to understand what the guide is, because the guide is what allows the blade to cut. And since the blade can only cut five hundredths roughly to seven hundredths of a millimeter, you're limited in where you can put that blade. If it cuts too much on the side, it's going to pull the cane out of the bed. So it has to cut evenly across. So therefore, the guide and the blade have to work together. And I would argue that the guide is, in fact, more critical than the blade. What I'm finding is that Philadelphians are using this model. This is not how the American reed was envisioned. And I'll show you what my guide is. This is my setup. There's more of a curve to it. It's not so flat. And what I shoot for, for me, what are magic numbers, and I'll tell you what they are. The center is 60. There. And then it tapers. That's 57. That's still strong. That's okay. But it's got to get down to about 53, 54, right in this area, because this is where the reed vibrates. It vibrates right in this area. And then the end, the sides are heavy enough. That's 46. I like 46, 47. So that, and this is about 8 millimeters across here, I think. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There you go. And so that's the width of the reed from here to here. That's the width. That's as far as it goes. So right here, we're looking at 40, 47 or so. Now, of course, it might cut thinner beyond that, but it doesn't matter because you don't use it. And that's another thing that you need to think about is that don't be so concerned about the parts of the reed you don't use. This is the most critical section of the reed, the center section here. This is it. This is where it happens, right here. This is where you have the strength for the opening, the vibration in the channels, and the filtering through the sides of the reed because the reed vibrates from the center to the sides, not the other way around. It vibrates from the front to the back, center to the sides, inside to the outside. That's how the reed vibrates. So if you have a piece of cane that's it's going to be um, 8 millimeters wide, for my machines it should be no more than 8 millimeters wide. The oboe reed is not wider than 7, so really it matters where the gouge is between 60 and 3.5 millimeters out. Because you don't use 45, and you don't use 47, because it's not part of the shape. And even the top of the shape you don't use, you cut it off, because you're only using the center part. So be concerned with the parts of the reed that you do use. And so we have this 
this area in here, we got vibration. We've got something that's not overly strong. There's a curve there for an opening, but it's not going to crush the reed. It's not going to clamp the reed. If you go over here and you're using about this much, there is no way that this is going to vibrate unless you scrape the center. It's not going to vibrate down the sides. But these are European reeds. They're not American reeds. If you bring this gouge up to 60, I mean, you, you have a lot of material here. You see this? There's not a room for vibration. And there's no filtering. And you have to scrape the center of the reed to get it to vibrate, to, to have it to make sound. You have a curve like this. At 60 in the center, it's not going to vibrate. It's too much wood. It's too strong. And so, you know, Americans that make reeds this way, they have this like pseudo Philadelphia style where they scrape a lot out of the back and they have long tips because you have to have a longer tip with stronger cane. If you've seen any photographs of older players, they got shorter tips, weaker setup, softer cane. If the curve is thin, like in Europe, they use 55, 57. Well, that's fine. They scrape down the middle, it'll vibrate and they'll still have an opening. But it doesn't work like that with American reeds. It just doesn't. And I'm finding that there are people that are going after these models. Now, what Tabato gave us, the guide and the bed. And what Mac gave us was a blueprint for the blade. Here we have some blades, and this is where I think people get a little confused. When they're talking about 11 millimeter blades, and what is the relief angle on these blades? This is very important. If I were to make a blade, which I'll do right now, I do... Which is going to be this arc here, and it's going to be five. And then we are going to make it cut. And I'll just do this so that you can see. I'm trying to show you, give you an example. And uh, let's first off, there's a sketch. We're going to extrude this 3.5. What's the cutting angle? Well, I like to do 40 degree relief because it um, enables the blade to cut well. I'm going to put this over here. Now what we're going to do, this is an 11 millimeter curve, but it's at a 50 degree angle. When we extrude it through the, the steel, we get our cutting angle and we have our blade. The top of the blade is 4.5 roughly. And this is what Mac told us. Mac said that the top of the blade is roughly 4.5 millimeter radius. Tabato gave us the guide, 5.5 and 5. And the bed is 5.5, 11 millimeters. You can gouge cane between 10 and 11 millimeters, and you'll get the same opening. Because here's the thing. We work the reed from the inside out. In Europe, they work the reed from the outside in. They need the outside diameter to determine the opening and the gouge. But we don't do that. But what's happening is you have people that are supposed to be American players and they are using outside diameters to determine the opening. This is not how it's done. This is not the point of the American reed. It's really disconcerting to see this happening. And I know some players are like strong reeds, but there's strength and then there's impossible. It's just not Dolce playing. You just can't get that from these style reeds. Europeans need the outside diameter of the bark to keep the opening. But that's the reverse of what we do here is that the arch in the center of the gouge in America is what maintains the opening. So it's kind of a paradox to think that if you use a smaller tube diameter cane that you'll have a bigger opening, particularly when you scrape all of the bark off. It plays a much less of a role. The gouge is determined by the center. The center, the apex of the blade, is really where it's at. It's not so much the, the, the center to the side relationship, which, you know, in a single radius it can be. For Americans, it's this area in here that is the gouge. And that's why it's, it's so difficult to find sometimes. And more of a V-shaped blade will give you a stronger gouge in a double radius, whereas a more circular curve will give you a weaker gouge in the double radius, whereas the opposite is true in the single radius. Well, let me show you a, a blade. So this is the blade that's the 1918 blade. And if I could show it to you briefly, and this is works with the double radius. And this is why American blades look so goofy, is because we don't cut mostly on this side. For my machines, it's the outside. 
we cut more toward the inside. This is the E-blade that I have. This is a wonderful blade. Difficult to make. I usually have to do work with it because the CNC's don't quite get it right. But it's um, less here, so it's a bigger diameter, so it doesn't cut as much. And it cuts more flatter at the top, but then it drops rather quickly. So we get a little thicker sides here. And it's a little flatter at the top so that I can get my 60 to 53 as quick as possible. That's why it's a little circular, but then here it's, it's a more angled and this side doesn't cut. All right, this is a graph guide copy that I did. It's got two radii. It has five for the small side and 5.5 for the large, big side. And it's split right down the middle. Now mine is slightly different. I have 5.25, 5.5, but it's turned 15 degrees. And the point is I wanted to have strength in the center, I want it to be more strength because I find that the graph guide, this guide, it's not strong enough. The thing you need to understand about this, about some of these things, is that when you pair a blade to the guide, what happens is a circular blade with a single radius guide is stronger than a V-shaped blade with a single radius. But... With a double radius, a V-shaped blade is stronger uh, than a circular blade. The other thing that I wanted to talk about finally was the guide. This is the guide. These two parts is known as the guide. And what you need to understand about that is that the rear guide has no bearing on the curve of the cane. None. The forward guide is what determines the curve. And the relationship between the forward guide and the blade is what determines how the blade cuts. Now, there's some people that want to put a file to the guide and make it their own, and you need to be careful because here's the thing about the guide that you got to understand, is that the forward guide must be taller than, wider than, larger than the rear guide, definitely taller than the rear guide, or the blade will not cut. It just will not cut. doesn't matter how sharp it is, where it is. The only way it'll cut is if you move it all the way to the side, and then it'll just pull the cane out of the bed. So you need to be careful when you file a guide. Now, I'm not opposed to filing the guide, and if you were to file a guide on my machine, it's not a big deal because I just send you the guide and uh, for 50 bucks you could uh, experiment and do it over again. If you're using an older machine or like um, a graph style machine or others, American made machines, and you file the guide and you don't file the back portion of the guide to be less than what's in the front, that part that you filed will not be cut because the rear guide interferes with it. It interferes with the blade. And this part um, has to be taller. And that's all there is to it. Now, the rear guide has does affect the length of the chip, but it just doesn't affect the, the curve. And then that's probably a shocker to most people. But it's the, that's the physical aspect of the machine and how it works. So I'm not sure if that clarified anything for you, but I just want you to understand that, you know, if you want to make a certain kind of read... Uh, you need a certain kind of equipment. I know people want to make money selling things, but, you know, if you think that you're going to be able to make American-style reeds with European gouges, that's just not a possibility. It's not. And if you don't play a Larray oboe, you're really going down a, a path that, you know, will be very frustrating for you. I mean, I have a lot more that I could talk about, including the bore and uh, shapes and the relationship between tone and vibration and, and so on. But I think today that that'll end the lecture. As always, best wishes.